All right, well, welcome to Legal Aspects of Sport and Recreation. Obviously, we're going to start with the intro chapter. And in that chapter, it covers primarily the basic outline of the U.S. legal system. And so we'll get into uh, some of the court structure, but also some sources of law as well. So one of the things that I do in this class is offered in a traditional format is I typically ask students, if we say that you broke the law, what does that mean? Or, or well, we all have a pretty good idea of what that means, but, but what is the source of that law? Where did it come from? You obviously transgressed something that has been written down, and so because of that, there may be some sort of a penalty. So where do those laws come from that tell me what I can and can't do? And most specifically, they generally tell me what I can't do. And so usually students have a, a wide variety of guesses. It might be, you know, some one student will say um, they come from Congress, they come from the president, maybe they come from the state legislature. So there's a wide variety of guesses. And to an extent, most of those are true. People are usually pretty close. So the first thing that we're going to talk about are the four primary sources of law. So where those laws come from. So the first source of law is referred to as common law, or there are some alternative terms that you can see on the slide as well. So there's also, it's common law is also known as case law or judge-made law. And so a related term is precedent. And so what a precedent is, or what common law or case law is, is there was some sort of a legal proceeding that went through the court. The court then reached a decision, so they, they rendered a verdict. And so based on that verdict, that becomes the court's interpretation of the law going forward. So, for example, if I go to a minor league baseball game and I'm struck by a foul ball and I'm injured because of being struck by that ball, one of the things that might occur to me is say, well, you know, because I got hit with the ball, I suffered some damages, so I had to go to the hospital, so I have some medical bills, I couldn't go to work for a couple days because I had a concussion, and so that cost me some money, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to seek to be made whole, I'm going to sue the baseball team because they were negligent in the setup of the ballpark, maybe they distracted me so I wasn't watching the field, maybe their netting doesn't extend far enough, that sort of a thing, so I'm going to sue this minor league baseball team to try to recover those damages. Well, if I were to do that, the case law is pretty well settled in the case or, or, or with respect to um, people being injured because of flying objects at sporting events. And so based on those previous precedents, based on those previous court decisions, it is really unlikely that I would be successful in my suit against that minor league baseball team unless they did something that is not in keeping with those previous precedents. So basically with respect to uh, netting around a baseball field, um, the general guideline is that there has to be netting directly behind the stands and um, there has to be a sufficient amount of netting for the fans who might want it. So as long as you, as the minor league baseball team, had uh, netting that was consistent with the rest of the league and then with your, your counterparts potentially across leagues, then you're probably not going to lose that case. So based on previous case law, I would know if I was thinking about filing that lawsuit that it would be pretty unlikely that I would be successful, so I probably wouldn't file that lawsuit. So there's a term there, stare decisis, which means to stand by things decided. And the gist of that is courts generally abide by previous rulings within their circuit. So if we're talking about um, state courts, uh, if you're talking about a state trial court, which is the lowest level of state court, they're generally going to abide by rulings made by state appeals court and obviously by the state supreme court. So everybody within that circuit abides by those same set of rulings. Now, as you'll see, as we get to, to the last slide, there are different circuits. So I'll show you the last slide is the federal circuits. And so they may decide things a little bit differently. Um, but generally, within your circuit, um, everybody will decide things basically the same way unless there are some pretty significant differences in the facts of the case. So the idea is that courts are not going to disrupt the law any more than necessary. If me being struck by a baseball is pretty similar to somebody else who is struck by a baseball and it was ruled against them, it was ruled in, the case was ruled in favor of the uh, baseball owners, then this court is probably going to going to decide the same way. And so the reason that that principle exists, that idea of stare decisis, to stand by things decided, the reason that exists is to ensure consistency within the law. So I won't get one ruling uh, if I file a case of being struck by baseball this year and a different ruling next year, right? So the idea is to ensure consistency. And then the other thing about that is it helps keep the number of cases down, believe it or not. 
because if you know that any number of other people, let's say there have been a dozen other cases that are pretty similar to mine and they've all gone um, in favor of the baseball team, well then it really doesn't make sense for me to file my lawsuit because I'm, I can be pretty sure that I'm gonna lose. So one of the ideas behind this idea of stare decisis, to stand by things decided, is to minimize the number of cases that come before the court. So because of that predictability, you have a good idea if you're gonna lose, you probably shouldn't file that case. Or conversely, if there's a pretty good chance you're gonna win, then you're probably gonna file that case. So the good thing there is that it ensures consistency. So this is the bullet point there. So how might um, the use of previous cases to determine future rulings be both advantageous and disadvantageous? Well, I gave you the advantageous aspect that ensures consistency within the law and possibly keeps the number of cases down. Well, how could it be bad if courts always point to previous rulings and make their decision based upon those previous rulings? Well, one of the ways that that could be bad would be uh, if the original ruling was egregious. So, for example, if we look at the 1896 ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court of Plessy versus Ferguson, that was the case that legalized or established the doctrine of separate but equal. So it, it legalized segregation, right? And so if somebody then brought a case after 1896 and said that their... Um, constitutional right to equal protection was being violated, which it is, um, and, the, and the court said, yeah, you're right, but we have to abide by precedent, then that would still be the law of the land, right? So we would still have racial segregation, we would still have sex segregation, and uh, obviously that would be bad. So the idea of standing by things decided isn't absolute. Courts don't do that all the time, but the idea, again, is to not disturb the law any more than necessary. And so there have been some really important precedent-setting cases um, that still reverberate in sports today. So, for example, um, one of the ones that we may get some time to talk about comes from 1973, which is the case of Hackbart versus Cincinnati Bengals. And so in that case, what happened was you had um, Hackbart, I forget his, his first name, but he was a safety for the Denver Broncos. Um, and so the Broncos are playing against the Bengals. The Broncos are on defense and they're backed up into their own end zone. And so the Bengals are trying to score. They throw a pass to the running back. Pass gets intercepted. And so Hackbart, who had been playing safety, the other safety actually intercepts the ball. So Hackbart goes and tries to make a block, because now he's an offensive player since they have an interception. He goes and tries to make a block. He misses. But after having dove at, at one of the Bengals players, and missing, he gets up onto one knee to watch the rest of the play. One of the Bengals running backs is really frustrated about this turn of events and basically goes and um, hits Hackbart in the back of the head while he's on one knee. But he takes his forearm and kind of slams it into the back of Hackbart's head and knocks him to the ground um, while he's there on one knee. And so um, the result is that Hackbart has to leave the game. Um, he doesn't actually report the injury to the athletic trainers, he ends up packing his, his neck in ice during halftime because that plays right before the end of the first half. Uh, he goes back and plays. He actually plays for the next two weeks on special teams and then is waived by the Broncos and then after being waived actually goes and sees a physician. It turns out that he'd been playing for three weeks with a fractured uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth cervical vertebrae. Um, so pretty significant neck fracture and he'd been playing with it. Um, for what it's worth, Hackbart, former Badger, so obviously an exceptionally tough uh, individual that he played with a broken neck for three weeks wouldn't recommend it bad idea um, but ultimately in that case Hackbart then because that ends up being a career-ending injury Hackbart turns around and sues the Cincinnati Bengals because it was one of their players that injured him and so the the question before the courts becomes was that violence that he suffered something that would be expected during the course of an NFL football game or was that something that was sort of beyond the pale something that that one couldn't anticipate whenever they consented to play in a football game. And so the court found in that case that basically that was violence outside the, the norms and the rules of football. And so in that case, the Bengals could be held liable. They could have to pay a penalty to the plaintiff in that case, so to Hackbart, as a result of the injury. And so the precedent that that case established was that if there is violent behavior that is beyond the norms of the sport, beyond the, the rules of the sport, then that is behavior for which the defendant, the person doing the injuring, can be 
uh, civilly liable. So you could have to pay uh, damages for, for something that you did to hurt somebody else. Uh, again, outside of the rules. It'd have to be something really exceptional, really abnormal. So we don't see many of those kinds of cases, um, but it does happen here and there. I'll actually show you a, a video of one of those types of cases uh, in a few slides. Another case, uh, another precedent that continues to reverberate. So I'll, I'll lay this one out for you uh, as an example. So if the um, Milwaukee Brewers decided, you know what, we want to move and be the I don't know, Montana Brewers or something. There it is. One of their minor league teams is the Montana Brewers. But nonetheless, let's say the Brewers are fed up with Miller Park, um, about to be AmFam Park, and they decide that they have a better offer somewhere else and they want to go play in a new ballpark. In order for the Brewers to do that, they actually have to get approval from all the other owners in Major League Baseball, which for any sport other than baseball is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and is something that's not allowed. So for example, in, in sports other than baseball, you see a lot of movement of teams. So most recently in, in the NFL, we've seen the movement of the Rams, the Chargers, and the Raiders. Um, the first two, I forget what order I laid them out in, but the Chargers and the Rams went to LA and then the Raiders went to Vegas. Um, and you don't see that kind of movement in, in baseball. And the reason for that is um, so the other leagues, they don't have to have unanimous approval of the, of the other owners in order for those franchises to relocate. Because again, that's a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act from the 1890s. I think it's 1893. Um, but why baseball is the only sport that still has that exemption comes actually from a ruling referred to as federal baseball from 1922. So because of a, a Supreme Court ruling from 1922 that uh, essentially found that baseball was not interstate commerce, which in 1922 it wasn't, um, but obviously Major League Baseball is pretty different now. Because of that ruling from 1922, um, baseball franchises still have to get unanimous consent of the other owners in order to move, so they're a lot less mobile, versus all of the other big four, so uh, NFL, NBA, NHL, they don't have to get unanimous consent of the other owners. They can move wherever they want. So, those are two examples of, of things that reverberate as far as precedence to this day. So based on uh, Hackbart, you can, if you're injured in the course of a, a violent sport like football or hockey, um, because of, of something that you could not have anticipated, violence outside the norms of the sport, that's something that you can sue for. And again, the other one I pointed to was uh, franchise relocation. Because of a, a case exempting baseball from the Antitrust Act from and the actual ruling was from 1922. Um, baseball can do certain things that other that the other the remaining Big Four, so the other Big Three, NHL, NFL, NBA, that those those leagues are not allowed to do. So that's because of an exemption from 1922. So based on precedent. All right. So another example or another source of law is constitutional law. So as you can see there, the things that the Constitution does. So I'll give you some dates because. You know, history is fun. Um, so the U.S. Constitution was adopted in 1787, and the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, was adopted in 1791. And so each state has a constitution, and then obviously there's the U.S. Constitution, pictured there on the right side of the screen. And the basics of what a constitution does is to outline the structure of government. So the U.S. Constitution, for example, says that the government has three branches, Obviously, the, the wording is a little bit different than what I'm using, but the gist of it is it says that the government has three branches. So you've got the legislative branch, so that includes the House of Representatives and the Senate, so that's Congress. And then you've got the executive branch, which is the presidency. And then you've got the judicial branch, which at the very top includes the Supreme Court. So, and then it enumerates what each of those branches does, right? So there's that concept um, of checks and balances where Congress passes the laws, the uh, president signs the laws, and then once you have those two branches of the government uh, passing the law, the law and then signing the law, then that goes into action. Um, and in addition to that, Congress also has what's referred to as the power of the purse, right? So they control the budget, as opposed to the executive branch, so uh, the presidency at the federal level, uh, is in charge of enforcing the law. And then the courts are in charge of interpreting the law, right? And so they all interact with each other um, to devise laws, to enforce laws, and then to interpret laws. So the Constitution then outlines the basic structure of the government. It says the things that the government can do. So for example, at the federal level, the government 
can levy taxes, the government can print money, the government can raise an army, right? So all those things are in the Constitution. Um, but what the Bill of Rights does, again, the, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, now plus some, so we've, we've included um, additional amendments to the Constitution. Um, and so what those constitutional amendments do, by and large, is they say the things that the government cannot do, right? So, for example, the government cannot infringe upon your right to freedom of speech. Now, there are a few important caveats that I want to touch on here, and then we'll get to them again when we get to the constitutional law chapter. The first, as it says there, is that the rights are not absolute. So even though you do have a right to freedom of speech, you do have the right to say things that are unpopular and all of that, um, one important thing there is that the guarantee is that that right will not be infringed upon by the government. So the important term there is it won't be infringed upon by a state actor. So that includes the federal government, the state governments, and then all their branches thereof. So for example, uh, UW-Whitewater is a state university, so we would, we would be considered a state actor. As opposed to Marquette University is a private Catholic institution, they're not a state actor. So they have a, a little bit more leeway to infringe upon those constitutional rights, like freedom of speech, than a state university would. So an important thing to know then is those rights are guaranteed not to be infringed upon by a state actor. And again, I, I say guarantee where it says that those rights aren't absolute. So um, while you do have the right to freedom of speech, there are certain constraints on that, right? So you have, um, for example, the, the right to protest. So you could say, you know, one of your positions could be that the tuition at UW-Whitewater is too high. And so you may uh, go out and pick it. You may, you know, have protest signs that say tuition at Whitewater is too high, and that's something that is perfectly acceptable to say, um, and it may not be popular, right? So you're, you're using your, uh, or exercising your right to freedom of speech, um, but if you were to go picket outside of the uh, chancellor's office, you know, you're outside of the main office, the main uh, building at Whitewater, whose name for whatever reason escapes me at the moment, it'll come back to me later. Anyway, uh, if you're outside of that main building, uh, picketing, then that would be perfectly acceptable. But if you were then to take your protest into the street and block traffic, well, then that's something that's probably not acceptable. Um, and so the thing there is that the government, if they make you move out of the street with your protest, what they're doing is they're, they're not telling you you can't say that, they're just telling you you can't say that here. And there are other limitations on speech, including things like inciting violence. Um, so, for example, the, the classic Supreme Court example that has been used in precedence is that uh, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, right? Because that's going to cause a stampede. People are going to get hurt. And so you can't say um, that I, I can say whatever I want. I've guaranteed freedom of speech when my speech led directly to people being injured because I caused a panic, right? So the rights aren't entirely absolute. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about constraints on those rights and how the courts evaluate those when we get to the constitutional law chapter. But as far as constitutional law and sport, um, some concepts we'll talk about quite a bit. Is, uh, the first one on there, so the Equal Protection Clause, that's in both the 5th and the 14th Amendments. Equal protection deals with when the government discriminates. So when the government treats people who are uh, similarly situated differently. So there are times when that is acceptable, but there are other times where that's not acceptable. So obviously the government has to discriminate at certain times. So for example, the government says you can't um, purchase alcohol if you're under the age of 21. So obviously the government is, is separating people and treating them differently. This group gets to buy alcohol, this group doesn't. Um, but if the government says you can't play soccer because you're a woman, well, then the government's gonna have to justify that decision. And so um, one of the things that, that allowed women to play sports, everybody's pretty familiar with Title IX, but actually just as important and probably more important is the uh, guarantee to, or the right to equal protection that is guaranteed or enshrined in the 14th Amendment. Um, and essentially women sued saying that um, they were being discriminated against on the basis of sex. They weren't allowed to play Little League Baseball. They weren't allowed to play soccer and any number of other sports solely because of their sex, right? So that's the, the concept of equal protection. Due process means that if something is being, being taken away from you by the government, whether that is um, life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness, um, so maybe they're taking away, um, you know, maybe the government is depriving you of a scholarship. So if you go to a state university and you get kicked off of your scholarship, um, the government is effectively taking money away from you. And so in order for them to do that, 
um, they have to justify that decision. And they also, where due process comes in, what, what you have to do is have a chance to respond and a chance to appeal that decision. So that's due process. If you don't, if the government just takes it away from you and there's no chance for you to answer, no chance for you to appeal, then that's a violation of your due process rights. Um, freedom of speech, we've talked about, so that's enshrined in the First Amendment. Uh, also enshrined in the First Amendment is that the government shall not establish an official state religion. We'll get to that in the constitutional law chapter, as well as the free exercise of religion, that you can you have the ability to practice your religion as you see fit. And we'll talk about um, some cases in sport related to that again in that constitutional chapter. And then unreasonable search and seizure. If you're doing the discussion board this week and you haven't already answered this one, uh, this is one of the ones I'm looking for. Uh, with respect to the discussion board prompt on drug searches or on uh, drug testing. So oftentimes athletes will claim that drug testing violates their Fourth Amendment right to uh, or protection from unreasonable search and seizure. So they're going to have to prove that it's a state actor engaging in that infringement and then um, prove that, the, that it is a search and that the search is unreasonable. And so without giving away the answer to... Um, this week's discussion board. I'll move on from there, uh, but I'll give you that answer after we're through this module. So that's constitutional law. Again, basic structure, um, how the government's set up, the powers that the government has, and then the rights that the citizens have that the government cannot infringe upon except under um, really particular circumstances. All right, so moving on from constitutional law, we have statutory law. So statutes are passed by, uh, at the federal level, they're passed by the U.S. Congress, so the U.S. House or, Sen or Senate, they go both ways, um, but, but there will be legislation that will originate, let's say, in the U.S. House of Representatives, gets passed to the House of Representatives, goes on to the U.S. Senate, passes in the Senate, and so it has now passed out of the legislative branch, goes to the executive branch for approval. So, uh, and then once approved, then that becomes a federal statute. Same process at the state level. So here in Wisconsin, there's the state assembly, which is analogous to the U.S. House of Representatives. There's the state senate, and then there's the governor. So you change the names a little bit, but the concepts are basically the same. So state statutes include things uh, related to um, murder, theft, those kinds of things. Um, and then at the local level, you have uh, ordinances, which are the same concepts. So maybe they're passed by your... Um, village council or your alderman or your whatever whatever your city council equivalent is in your particular municipality um, those are ordinances and so those include things like noise ordinances or parking or speeding or those kinds of things right so there's also state statutes related to uh, maximum speeds but um, local ordinances typically deal with you know speeds in certain zones and those kinds of things all right, so obviously there's some overlap between each of those things, um, and then sometimes there is conflict between each of those things. So um, classic current example um, is, the, well, I guess classic and current example, is that um, at the federal level, it is still illegal to possess and use marijuana recreationally, right? Uh, but in certain states, for example, in Illinois, it is not. So how does that work? So if it's, it's, it's illegal in the entire country, so per federal statutes it's illegal, but in the state of Illinois it's legal, how does that work? Well, the idea there is um, the doctrine of supremacy prevails. So whatever the higher institution is, so federal law trumps state law, state law trumps or beats uh, local law. So that's the idea there. That's what's what the doctrine of supremacy says. Now that said, how is it then... <laughs> That, that's a thing. How is there legal marijuana in uh, Illinois or in Colorado or any number of other states? And the answer to that question is effectively that the federal government has chosen not to enforce those laws. So while it's still illegal to possess and use marijuana uh, from a federal standpoint, if the federal government doesn't enforce its own laws, then it has the effect that those things are legal. Effectively, the, the federal government is uh, turning a blind eye to those particular statutes that it has. So that's how um, marijuana laws have changed. But in general, if there is a conflict and if um, the higher, higher authority, if you will, wants to flex its muscles and wants to enforce its laws, well, then the federal laws supersede, is a better way of saying that, supersede the state laws, state laws supersede the local laws. 
Um, and then there are some statutes that we'll run into in sport and recreation. So you've got the Americans with Disabilities Act, which deals with accommodation. Um, so for example, that might dictate the design of your field house and your locker rooms and your stadiums, those kinds of things to ensure accessibility. Or Title IX says that you can't discriminate on the basis of sex with respect to educational opportunities. So from a, a sporting standpoint, we are familiar with Title IX in terms of uh, proportionality of opportunities for women to play sports, um, that those opportunities are substantially proportional to the opportunities provided for male athletes. And so if you're an athletic director, that's one of the things that you'll have to do is to ensure Title IX compliance. And then beyond those, sometimes there will even be, so those two, the, AD, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and Title IX, both of those are federal statutes. And then at times there are state laws that pertain to sport as well. So Natasha's law is one that is specific to Texas because it's a state statute. And so it was passed in uh, 2012. And so what it does is require special concuss concussion training for coaches and athletic trainers. So there was this whole... Um, raft of laws in states across the U.S. that, that sort of passed uh, in the late 2010s and early 20 teens related to the handling of concussions. Um, and so Texas's particular laws and Tasha's law, and effectively um, it authorizes certain individuals to return an athlete to play after concussion. So a particular school district in Texas will have to designate their athletic trainer, a physician, um, and then maybe one or two other people that are able to clear an athlete to return to play um, so that they can continue to participate in their sports. If you've got a football player who gets a concussion that's been diagnosed by the team physician, they're not allowed to return to play until one of those four people that's been identified by the school district clears them to return. And the reason Texas passed that was because um, athletic trainers and team physicians were running into individuals engaged in doctor shopping, right? Um, so... If you've not met me before, I'm originally from Texas, and um, and I'm also an athletic trainer. Um, and some friends of mine who were high school athletic trainers in Texas in around 2010 were complaining that they'd had an athlete, or they would have athletes, football players particularly, sometimes wrestlers, who would sustain concussions. The team physician, the athletic trainer, felt the athlete wasn't ready to go back because they were still getting headaches or had other symptoms. And so the athlete and their parents would, you know, because there's, there's this idea that you know, little Billy has to get a scholarship to play football at, you know, University of Texas or wherever. And so he needs to be on the field. And so the parents would then circumvent the athletic trainer or the team physician, and they would go to a local chiropractor who would sign off and say, yeah, this, this kid can go back and play. And so based on that, oftentimes the uh, school would say, okay, well, they do have a doctor's note from a chiropractor, but they do have doctor's notes. So we have to go back and let them play. And so Natasha's law was designed to not allow that to happen, to, to prevent that doctor shopping. So those are statutes. And then we got administrative law. So you got certain government agencies that have the ability to make rules that have the effect of laws. And so effectively what's happened there is that Congress has delegated some of its lawmaking ability to these agencies. So Ones that you'll run into in sports and ones that we'll talk about in this class. Uh, the first one there, the NLRB, is the National Labor Relations Board. And so what they do is they supervise the uh, they supervise union representation. Um, so they determine whether or not uh, a union election will be held at a particular work site, who the representatives will be, how the, the election gets carried out, all that kind of stuff. So the National Labor Relations Board then oversees unions. And so then we get to... Um, Talking about professional sports and collective bargaining agreements, we'll, we'll talk about the National Labor Relations Board some. Because it also comes up with um, strikes. So, for example, one of the most, I think the most recent strike in baseball from the mid-1990s, the one that, that sort of ushered in the steroid era, uh, the National Labor Relations Board ultimately stepped in and forced both parties to come back to the table and to continue bargaining. And then... OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. You might have had some exposure to them in uh, jobs that you have either now or you, you've had previously, particularly if you've handled chemicals. Um, so if you, let's say you were a lifeguard or you, you know, worked in an aquatic center, you had to handle pool chemicals, and so those would have had warnings on them and those kinds of things. And so the regulations for how those are, those are handled are, or they come from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So that's where OSHA comes in. And with respect to the NLRB, not to get too far ahead of myself, so this is probably ancient history for most of you in this class, um, but in 2014, the football players at Northwestern University 
were trying to get a union for their football team. So the question is, why would they try to do that? And the answer actually goes back to precedent. So college athletes are different than professional athletes. Um, obviously, they, they have different expectations. They have to go to class. They have to be enrolled in a certain amount of hours. They have to make academic progress, maintain GPA, all that kind of stuff, right? But from a legal standpoint, um, if a professional athlete, so let's say a, a football player in the NFL, if they're injured in the course of playing an NFL game, they have a they have right to workers' compensation. So they can be compensated for their injury. Let's say, particularly if it's a career-ending injury, um, they'll be compensated for that injury because their workplace is similar to a workplace injury you might suffer. You know, if you worked in a mine or um, some other sort of a dangerous job. So all of those individuals, because they're employees, are entitled to workers' compensation. College athletes, however are not considered employees of the university. And in fact, the NCAA has gone to great pains since the 1950s to specify that college athletes are quote unquote student athletes, right? And not to diminish, if anybody in this class is a student athlete, not to diminish that, um, but the reason that the uh, NCAA coined the term was to avoid colleges having to pay out workers' compensation for injuries. Um, colleges were worried about not being able to field athletic teams anymore because they would become too expensive. And so the NCAA came up with this idea of a student athlete and promoted it uh, relentlessly in courts. And so combined with the concept of amateurism, which we'll get into the history of amateurism later in the class, but combined with the concept of amateurism, the courts regard... Um, college athletes, again, as, as student athletes, is entirely different from your professional athletes, so not entitled to the same bargaining rights either. Um, so one of the things that the Northwestern players tried to do was they sought to get the National Labor Relations Board to allow them to elect a union for their football team. Because by doing that, if the NLRB allowed them to conduct a, new, a union election, what that would mean then is that those players are employees of the university rather than student athletes. And so by being able to unionize as Northwestern University football players, now they would have the same kinds of rights that NFL players have. So they'd have um, ability to bargain for medical care, they'd have ability to bargain for wages, again, workers' compensation, those kinds of things. And so... Um, the Northwestern football players petitioned the NLRB to host a union election in 2014. The NLRB declined. Um, but the reason the NLRB declined is not because they didn't feel that the football players were employees of the university. Rather, um, they essentially said there were two problems. One is that it wouldn't promote harmonious um, relations between employer and employees. But then the other one, and probably the more substantial and important one, is the idea that... Um, with those Northwestern players, if they were to, to unionize for just that one team, that's entirely different than how it works in the NFL. So in the NFL, the union is the NFL Players Association. The NFLPA represents players throughout the league. There's not a Green Bay Packers union and a Chicago Bears union and a Minnesota Vikings union. There's an NFL Players Union, right, or Players Association. And so the NLRB has effect effectively said that it, that was um, an incorrect bargaining unit. So from the standpoint of college athletes, of course, it becomes incredibly difficult because there's turnover of players um, every four years or five years, potentially, um, if you include a redshirt year in there. But because of that really high rate of turnover, it would be really difficult to unionize all Division One football players or all Division One basketball players. right? And so because of that, it becomes nearly impossible. But bringing it back away from the rabbit hole, back to this discussion. Um, so administrative law, then you've got certain agencies. The EPA would also fall under this, the Environmental, Environmental Protection Agency, and a number of others, but we just don't deal with the EPA much in sports. But um, they're government agencies whose rules have the effect of law. All right, so enough about the sources of law. So let's talk about types of law. So we're going to talk about two types of law, criminal law versus civil law. So... Um, and there's some important differences between the two. We're going to spend the vast majority of our time actually talking about civil law, which is something you're probably a little bit less familiar with, but it's more important in the context of what you'll actually deal with as a sport and recreation manager. So you can see there that criminal law is typically a violation of statutory law. So there's a law that says you can't physically harm another person. Probably, uh, I'm sure it's worded better than that, but that's the gist of it, right? So that would be if you go up and punch somebody, that could be criminal assault right? 
Um, and so then because you went up and punched somebody, then that's a violation of the statute that says that you can't do that. And so you might get arrested, you might have to go to court, and then once you go to court, uh, if you're convicted and found guilty, then you might have to pay a fine, you might have to do community service, you might have to serve some time in jail, depending upon what it is that you did and how many times you've done it. So all of those things fall under criminal law. So you violated a statute, so don't steal, don't murder, don't assault people, those kinds of things. Um, and so as far as criminal law goes, so I'm actually going to skip down to the fourth bullet point. It's the people versus. So it is the state or the people of that state against you. So it's the government against you. You violated a statute created by the government. And so because of that, the government is trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So it couldn't have been anything else. Nothing else could have happened. Um, the government's trying to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you, in fact, violated that statute, that you assaulted that person, that you stole something, whatever that is. And then the punishment, as mentioned, could be jail time, could be fines, and it could be, uh, or it could be something like community service, uh, probation. There's a wide variety or wide range of uh, punishments under criminal law. But those are, those are generally them. An important thing about criminal law, an important distinction between it and civil law, however, is that Let's stick with the assault example. Let's say you punch somebody. Um, if you did that, you're tried under criminal law, you're found guilty, you have to pay a fine, let's say. That's, that's your punishment. Um, what happens to the person that suffered the injury? What happens to the person on the receiving end of that punch? What do they get out of this? Nothing. They, they know that justice was served, um, so they get some, some satisfaction in that, I suppose. Um, but they're not compensated in any way for that. Now... What they can do is they can say, well, you know, I suffered uh, injuries. I had to go to the hospital. I missed work. All the same kind of stuff I, I mentioned with the, my hypothetical baseball injury earlier. Um, and so because of that, that guy punching me cost me money. And so I need to be made whole. And so I'm going to sue them to try to recover those damages. That's civil law. And so you've got two parties in civil law, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant. And those are actually their... Um, big grouping. So you, you could have numerous plaintiffs, you could have numerous defendants. But the, the basic way that it works is that the plaintiff is the injured party. So using the assault example, the plaintiff is the one that got punched. And the defendant is the one who allegedly did the punching, right? So the plaintiff is the injured party, the defendant is the party who allegedly did the injuring. And so the standard is a little bit different there. Um, in if you are tried for or tried under criminal law the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you did whatever it is that they're accusing you of so that's a really high bar um so beyond a reasonable doubt means effectively there's nothing else that could have happened as opposed to in civil law the standard as you can see there is the preponderance of evidence so it's more likely than not that you did what it is you're being accused of so it, it, it moves from being 99% in the case of beyond a reasonable doubt that you did that to more like 51%. So it's just more likely than not that you did what it is that you're accused of doing. And so again, um, typically here, the plaintiff is seeking damages. So they're seeking uh, money. They're seeking to be made whole. So that, that could be money to... Um, See, I have another. Oop, I don't. Okay, that could be money uh, to pay for their medical bills. It could be, uh, you know, pain and suffering. It could be um, emotional distress under really extreme circumstances. Um, it could be, you know, that you cost them a job opportunity because you you uh, defamed them, you slandered them, that kind of a thing, right? And so, under under civil law, the uh, plaintiff is trying to be made whole. They're trying to recover monetary damages. So those are some important differences between the two. So it's not, in the case of civil law, it's not the state against you if you're the defendant. Um, it is a private party, and then the state serves as the arb arbiter of uh, who wins and who loses in that case. So as mentioned earlier, um, there is a there are different standards in the case of sports. So we've got some really violent sports like hockey there, pictured in the lower right. So violence is, is part of the game, right? And so if somebody comes up and slams you in the hallway, well, that's assault. But if somebody slams into you on um, or while you're on a hockey rink, then that's just part of the game. And so there's an important concept of consent involved with sports. If you don't want to be hit, 
don't play hockey. If you don't want to be slammed into, don't play football. But if you choose to play hockey or you choose to play football, then you've consented to brutal body contact. You've consented to somebody slamming into you. But within the norms of the sport. So again, if something goes beyond the norms of the sport, then that could lead to a criminal case. So I'll give you two examples that come from hockey. Um, the first one here, so this is an incident that comes from uh, 2000, um, a game between the Boston Bruins, I believe, pretty sure, and then uh, the Canucks. The guy getting injured is definitely a Canucks player. So it's uh, McSorley and Brashear. I'm just going to show you a quick clip of the video. And so I'm going to pull my pointer up here. You don't really need the volume. You can here to buzz in a little bit. So watch this player there. So I'm get smacked. So I'll back it up a little bit so you can see it again because they don't do a replay. All right, one more time. So you're watching the guy in white for um, Vancouver getting hit in the head by a stick um, by Marty McSorley, who plays for the Bruins. Here we go. This guy there, wham, right in the head. And then you also see he slams his head on the ice, suffers a severe concussion. Um, you can see some of the posturing that goes on there from as a result of hitting his head on the ice. Um, and so that was a pretty serious injury. Um, so what ends up happening there, I think Brashear ends up missing the rest of the season. And I'll switch to my next video. So I think Brashear ends up missing the rest of the season. And then McSorley, um, ultimately that becomes a criminal case. So he said that he wasn't trying to hit Brashear in the head, that he was trying to tap him on the shoulder with a stick to get him to fight, but he missed and hit him in the head instead. Um, of course, the court wasn't buying that. So that was that was one of the rare cases where um, something that happened on the ice actually became a criminal case. So I'm going to show you something similar here. So you're going to watch this player from the Canadians. It's Max Pacioretty. plays for the Vegas Knights now, if you still follow hockey, um, or at least he did last year. Um, so there's Pacioretty. I'm going to show you one more time. And there's a different view. So you can see the player for the Bruins in white in this game uh, slams the player for the Canadians, Max Pacioretty, into that stanchion. Uh, and it resulted in a concussion, obviously, and then also a neck fracture. I think he fractured C4 in his neck. So this is this game happens, uh, as you can see from the the uh, title of the video there. So this game is in March of, of 2011. Uh, ends up being a season-ending injury for Pacioretty, but he comes back. But ultimately, um, there is... So the guy that, that uh, puts him into the glass there is a guy named Zidane Chara, and he gets kicked out of that game, but that's it. There's no fine, there's no suspension, no nothing that, that uh, happens to him. And so effectively what, what happened there is that the league felt that that was within the norms of hockey, certainly a little bit violent, but possibly accidental. It, it, you couldn't show or couldn't prove that that was an intentional act. And so because of that, there was no fine, no suspension. Initially, so this game happens in Montreal, um, and so one of the local, I don't know if it's the local Montreal PD or if it's the essential provincial police, essentially the provincial police, but somebody talks about making a criminal case of it, but decides they're not able to prove that what Chara uh, did there was so far beyond the pale of the norms of the hockey that they decide not to pursue a case. All right, so bring these things, bring this back up. Okay, so there's criminal versus civil law. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of a lawsuit. So as you can see there, the major components include pre-trial, the trial itself, and the post-trial. And as you'll see here in a second, there's a lot that happens pre-trial. And in fact, most of the action is pre-trial. Um, and most cases never actually go to trial. So there are a lot of steps involved in the pre-trial process. So the first step is the complaint. And so what happens in the complaint is that the plaintiff, the party that has been damaged, details the facts of the case that they believe justify their claim, and then they request damages that they are trying to recover from the defendant. So the example I'm going to use, I'll use here is, uh, let's pretend that uh, I'm in the Williams Center weight room, I'm working out, there happens to be a puddle 
somewhere on the weight room floor that shouldn't be there. And so I slip in that puddle, I fall down, and I, let's say, fracture my tailbone. So I'm injured as a result of that uh, puddle that shouldn't be there. And so in the complaint, what I'll do then is lay out all those facts. I'll say I was in the Williams Center weight room on whatever day and time. Um, these are the conditions. This, these were approximately how many people were in there. There was a, a puddle on the floor that resulted from a faulty air conditioner or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, there was a puddle that shouldn't have been there. I slipped and fell, broke my tailbone or my cossacks, and um, suffered these medical damages, uh, these medical bills. Uh, and because of that, had to miss class, whatever other damages I allege. Right. So those are, that's my complaint. And in that complaint, I'm also going to include the parties. So I am the plaintiff. I was the only person that was injured here. So I'm going to be the plaintiff. Um, and then the defendant, what I will probably do in that case um, is I would sue the whoever was the attendant, the, the student worker that was supervising the weight room at the time. Because essentially I would allege that they were negligent, that they knew or they should have known about that puddle, and so they should have cleaned it up. It shouldn't have been there. And the only reason it was there for me to slip and fall is because of their negligence, and so I was injured as a result of their negligence. But in addition to that, I'm not only going to sue that student worker, but I'm also going to sue their boss. So um, and my, my allegation there is essentially going to be that the boss, their supervisor, knew or should have known that her employees weren't circulating the floor like they should have, that they were um, habitually negligent, they were careless, etc. So part of the reason I'm doing that is because I want to get as much money as possible. <laughs> um, so I might be seeking some punitive damages, which are not damages just to compensate me for my actual injury, but damages above and beyond to punish them for their negligence. So what I want to do then is to sue the people with the deepest pockets. So if I sue a student worker, what are they making for that job? 10 or $12 an hour, somewhere in that range, right? Um, so they probably don't have a ton of money, but their boss, their supervisor, has a salaried position. So they probably have, comparatively, quite a bit more money. So I definitely want to sue them as well. And then I would also sue the university. Um, and so in suing the university, that may be a failure to supervise. It may be that they knew or should have known that the uh, person in charge of the Williams Center weight room wasn't doing a very good job. It could be related to not performing routine maintenance on the air conditioner that allowed the puddle to be there, that kind of a thing. But again, the reason I'm suing the university is because their budget is um, tens of millions of dollars, right? And so um, by suing them, I'm hoping to get lots of money back. <clears throat> So those are the parties. So there is the plaintiff, the injured party, and then there are the defendants, the, the people in this case whose negligence led to the injury, allegedly. Um, and as a plaintiff, you try to name as many parties as possible because you're really just hoping something will stick and you're also hoping to get as much money as possible, probably. So the little NCAA blue disc is on there because they are oftentimes included as one of the parties, especially if we're talking about a lawsuit related to eligibility. So if an athlete, um, let's say, these rules have changed a little bit recently, but let's say five years ago, if an athlete um, decides to go out and get an agent, and then, so by doing that, they become a professional athlete, and then they try to come back and play in college, and the NCAA says, no, by getting an agent, you are effectively a professional, and so you can't be a college athlete anymore. And that's a fairly common cause of lawsuits uh, against the NCAA. Um, now, the NCAA usually prevails. So going back to the whole precedent thing, um, I wouldn't file one of those lawsuits, but nonetheless, people do. So um, in that case, the NCAA, um, because they, they um, enforce those rules, then they're going to be one of the parties that's usually included in the lawsuit. Um, most recently, or one of the recent cases with the NCAA, has been that they were named a party in a lawsuit by North Carolina athletes or at the University of North Carolina um, related to, and this is actually now four years old, I think, but um, I'm pretty sure this was in 2016. Um, effectively, North Carolina had what are referred to as paper classes, where all you had to do was register for this class and write one 10 page paper and that would give you credit for a three hour class. And, and essentially everybody got A's. Um, oftentimes the papers weren't even read. You had to turn in something and then you get an A. 
And so they were used to keep athletes eligible. And so athletes sued the NCAA saying that they failed to supervise and that the athletes didn't get the education they were promised. Um, and so because of that, since they were athletes, that the NCAA was at fault because the athletes are the school was pushing them into those classes just to try to maintain their athletic eligibility. And the NCAA also has some wording on their website that says that they're committed to give young people opportunities to learn, play, and succeed. I'm reading some of their wording there. Um, and then it goes into the whole student-athlete model. And so because of that, the athletes allege that the NCAA failed to supervise these colleges. The NCAA in turn said, well, that's the, actually the job of the accrediting body for the entire university, which for North Carolina is the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Um, so they were probably, um, their acronym is SACS, they were probably also included in the lawsuit. Other things on there. Uh, so whenever you file a lawsuit, it has to be th the court in which you file it has to have jurisdiction to decide that case. So a couple aspects to that. So there's personal jurisdiction and then there's subject matter jurisdiction. So personal jurisdiction means you have to have some business um, in that state, for example, if you file a lawsuit in state court. So using my slip and fall in the whitewater weight room example, I would have to file that case in Wisconsin state courts um, because that's where I live. I'm, I'm a Wisconsin resident. The university is in Wisconsin, so the, the personal jurisdiction of the court um, would all fall under Wisconsin. I couldn't decide I had this slip and fall incident here at uh, UW-Whitewater and I'm a Wisconsin resident, but um, Courts in Washington State are very favorable favorable to these slip and fall cases, so I'm going to file my court. I'm going to file my case in Washington State because I'm more likely to get a ruling in my favor. You can't do that because I don't have any business in Washington State. The university is not in Washington State, so there's no personal jurisdiction there. And then the other one is subject matter jurisdiction. So, um, for example, to file a case in federal court, there are some requirements that have to be met. So the damages have to be more than seventy five thousand um, dollars. Typically, they involve cases where there is some sort of interstate commerce. So maybe it is that um, I was injured here in Whitewater, but I am a, an Illinois resident. So then maybe that would be something that could fall under federal court. Um, so the, the court in which you file the lawsuit has to have the authority to hear that particular uh, case. Similarly, you couldn't file a case um, where you request damages of $200,000 in small claims court. Right. So there's some specialization within the court. So you have to to uh, make sure that that court has the appropriate jurisdiction there. And then there's the summons. So once there is once the complaint comes about, the defendants have to be legally notified that there is litigation pending against them. So um, and it depends upon the state. Pretty sure Wisconsin is one where where individuals have to be served in person. Um, I think I'm 99% on that. Um, so you have to actually, they have to receive a physical document that says they have been summoned, not just in the mail, they have to be handed a document that says you've been summoned uh, to appear before the court because you are the subject of a lawsuit in this slip and fall case. Um, and so there, there are different companies that you can hire to deliver those summons. Once the summons has been delivered, then the court has the authority to review the case. You can't do that before the summons has been lawfully served. So once the defendants are notified of the litigation against them, then they will file their answer. And so in their answer, they can either deny what has been alleged in the complaint. They can affirm it, basically be like, yeah, I did that, which is pretty uncommon, as you would imagine. Um, and then the last thing is they can also file a counterclaim. So most commonly, you get some kind of uh, combination of denial plus a counterclaim. So not only did that not happen, um, but you have defamed me. You've, you've uh, damaged my reputation by making these allegations and by posting about me on social media or something. And so because of that, you you rather than uh, being the defendant, I'm actually the damaged party here. So I'm going to file a counter lawsuit. So that's one of the things that can happen in the answer. So collectively, then the complaint and the answer uh, are referred to as the pleadings. And then we've got discovery. So that's uh, essentially evidence gathering. So in my slip and fall case, uh, if that proceeded to discovery, 
What would happen then is that both my lawyers as the plaintiff and the defendant's lawyers for the university and, and the other parties that fall under the defense there would try to gather as much evidence as possible. So they're going to interview witnesses. They're going to review security footage. They're going to go through maintenance logs. They're going to go through um, the policies and procedures about how often the, the uh, weight room supervisors have to circulate the floor, those kinds of things. Um, they may... You know, depending upon the nature of the case, that's where you can subpoena uh, phone records, um, all those kinds of things. So it, it is um, discovery of evidence with the power of law behind it, where there can be subpoenas. And then there are the pretrial motions. Typically, each side will file for dismissal of the case, or file for uh, summary judgment, not dismissal, summary judgment of the case. They basically say, our case is so strong, you should just give it to us before we even go to trial. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. So in the case of the, the defendant, they're going to file for um, dismissal of, of the suit. Basically, this is wholly without merit. This never happened. They made up claims, etc. And so because of that, this suit should be dismissed. But if it's not, then it goes to trial. And so once we get to trial, the plaintiff, the injured party, goes first. And as you can see, they're going to give their opening statement. They're going to call witnesses. The defense will then cross-examine those witnesses, and then the plaintiff's attorneys re-cross-examine. So with respect to witnesses, there's two broad categories of witnesses. There are fact witnesses, and there are expert witnesses. So fact witnesses are people who saw what happened. So in my slip and fall incident, um, my fact witnesses would say, yeah, I was there, I was on the next uh, platform over, I had seen the water myself, I saw him slip and fall, and he looked like he was hurt, and then I came and came to his aid, and we called 911 or whatever. So the fact witnesses are people who were there at the time. As opposed to, expert witnesses give um, sort of background on what should have been done. So sticking with that example, uh, an expert witness might say, here's how often you should have your workers walk around the weight room floor to make sure that there aren't any dangers that are laying about. Um, so, for example, that might be some, somebody from um, the International Health and Racket Sports Association. So one of the big club or one of the big industry associations with for the fitness industry. There may be somebody from there. Um, but so basically they're going to give you kind of the guidelines. They're going to give you best practices, those kinds of things. Those are what expert witnesses do. Um, an example, so one of the things I was going to say is that with expert witnesses, you can actually just Google it. <laughs> you can find expert witnesses for any number of different things. Um, so personally, I haven't been an expert witness myself, but I've helped um, with some of the background uh, research for an expert witness. My actual doctoral training is in sport history, uh, specifically the history of strength uh, and strength sports. And so um, I got to help with a an intellectual property case. It was um, patent infringement related to an adjustable kettlebell. Um, kind of like those dumbbells where you, you move the pin down and it adds more weight. Very similar concept, but for a kettlebell, one uh, company was suing another, alleging that they had copied their design. And so I got to do some of the background on that. Um, so I helped, do, like I said, do the research for an expert witness. Um, so, but one of my actual sporting examples, um, so the, the Rutgers player there in the front, his name is Derek Randall. So he's a, a former Rutgers basketball player. Um, and so how he is relevant to this case is that there was an expert witness um, who helped him uh, make his case against Rutgers University. So what happened is that Derek Randall was a, obviously a really talented basketball player because he got to play or he did play Division I men's basketball. Um, but he had a pretty significant learning disability. And so his family was really concerned about where he went to school. And so with, with every coach that recruited him, his family said, you know what, we want to make sure because of his learning disability that he's going to have sufficient accommodations, that he's going to have access to tutors and academic counselors um, because um, due to his learning um, disabilities, he also has some pretty significant anxiety. So we want to make sure that those things are accommodated so that he can be successful both on and off the court. And so the coach for Rutgers was, at the time was a guy named Mike Rice. And so Mike Rice said, yeah, we can absolutely do those things. He'll have tutors. He'll have academic counselors. We're going to make sure that we fully, fully and effectively accommodate his disabilities here if he comes in place for us at Rutgers. And so the family decided, or, and Derek decided to go play at Rutgers. Um, but to give you a little background, 
here is a video of Mike Rice while he was coaching at Rutgers. Now I'm going to turn up the volume a little bit, maybe more than you'll need it, but that's okay. So quick clip from ESPN on Mike Rice. Rutgers head basketball coach Mike Rice's fiery style has been on public display before. Known for his coaching intensity, Rice was suspended by Rutgers for three games last December for his behavior at team practices, with few specific reasons cited by school officials at the time as to why. This is why. This is just some of the video that led to Rice's suspension. Outside the lines he's obtained not only the roughly 30-minute video reviewed by Rutgers officials, but also hundreds of hours of additional footage of Rutgers practices from the two seasons prior to this year. There are shots of Rice heaving balls at players, even at their heads, which you can see better here when the tape is slowed down. Have you ever seen a coach do that? No. I mean, unbelievable to me um, that somebody would feel that that technique can be successful. Eric Murdoch was a first-round draft pick and played nine seasons in the NBA. He was hired by Rice, whom he'd never met, in June 2010 to be Rutgers Director of Player Development. Murdoch says he went to Rutgers Athletic Director Tim Pernetti as early as last summer to inform him of Rice's coaching tactics. I mean, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, whenever Tim Panetti came into the gym, Mike Rice was on his best behavior. You know, he's clapping, he's positive, you know, as soon as Tim Panetti leaves, you know, every kid's an asshole, a bitch, a it, you know, a, a c you know, and that's how it was to witness that video and to see your coach physically putting his hands on players, physically kicking players, you know, firing balls at players from point blank range, the the verbal abuse, the belittling. Um, yeah, I was like in total shock that this guy wasn't fired immediately on the spot. So if you close this window, there you go. So if you're Derek Randall and you are having, you know, if you've got a learning disability, maybe you're having trouble grasping the plays, having Mike Rice uh, berate you, maybe use some homophobic slurs directed your way, um, putting his hands on you, maybe throwing balls at you, that's obviously not really helping with the anxiety that you have related to your learning disability. And so obviously um, some of Rice's behavior made Derek Randall's um, career harder at Rutgers. Um, in addition to that, there's some other stuff that, that Rice did where he'd go up to Randall and be like, okay, you ready to go in? And so Randall would take his stuff off and then you just would never put him in the game. So just little mind games like that. Um, and in addition to the stuff that happened on the court, um, not off the court, Randall was never actually assigned to tutors or academic counselors or any of that stuff. He got um, what the university called the life coach, which was one of the, the videographers for the basketball team, one of the, the people who had to take videos of practices and games. That person, wholly unqualified to do any sort of counseling, became Randall's life coach. And so obviously they didn't accommodate his disability, um, and he sued the university, sued the coach, and said that they had... Um, not accommodated his disability, but also had made his anxiety worse, made it impossible for him to succeed as a college basketball player. And so as a result, he dropped out of the university and had discontinued his career as a basketball player. And so um, one of the expert witnesses that Randall called in the case was a guy named Alexander Sasha Vardy, who is a forensic psychiatrist at NYU. And Vardy, as an expert witness, essentially said, outlined Randall's disorder, said, here are all the things he has going on. And based on what he has going on, if he was treated in this way, as it appears that he was, it's reasonable to conclude this is how he would have reacted. It's reasonable to conclude that that might have been something that pushed him out of college, that pushed him out of basketball. And so um, it, with the help of Barty's expert testimony, Randall was successful in his lawsuit against Rutgers, 
and ultimately won $300,000 in damages against the university. So that's where expert witnesses can come in. Again, they basically provide background. They talk about best practices, um, help, help the jury, help the judge better understand uh, the nuances in that case of uh, learning disabilities or, you know, in the case I mentioned earlier, um, the history of a particular implement, those kinds of things. Those are what expert witnesses do. So then the defense goes, they repeat the whole process. So they give an opening statement. They have their own set of witnesses. The plaintiff cross-examines those. The defense re-cross-examines those. Uh, and then the plaintiff goes last and gives their closing statement. So then after that, there is a verdict. So one side wins, one side loses. And then the losing side can choose to appeal the decision. But here's an important thing about the appeals process is if you're on the losing side, you can't appeal a decision simply because you don't like it. So obviously you probably don't like it because you lost. Now maybe you owe money. And so, um, so, but that can't be the basis of your appeal. So the appeal has to be a procedural issue. So typically that is that evidence was admitted that shouldn't have been, or evidence that should have been admitted was not, or, and this happens most often in jury trial, trials, um, one of the things that happens uh, before the jury goes back to deliberate is that the judge gives them instructions. He basically lays out the relevant case law. Here's what's been decided before. Here are some things to consider. And so those instructions to the jurors oftentimes become the subject of appeals. The losing party will basically say that the judge misinstructed the jury. Or if it's not a jury trial, it's just the judge rendering the verdict, then the losing side will essentially say that the judge misapplied the law, right? So it's a uh, problem with the application of the interpretation of the law. So at the appeals court level, there's no new trial. So the appeals judges, so there's, there's an odd number of them. So typically there's three or five of them. And so they will read through the transcripts of the trial. And then they also get briefs from both the plaintiff and the defense. Um, so the, the losing party uh, in their brief basically says, here's what the, what the judge did wrong in their instructions or with their handling of the evidence, those kinds of things. And so um, here's why we think this was incorrectly decided. And obviously the other side, whichever side won, will argue against that. So no new trial based on the transcripts of the case. And then the appeals court decides based on those transcripts. So it's, it's uh, majority wins. So if two out of the three um, rule in in the same way that the trial court did, well, then that's called affirming the decision. So if you affirm it, they agree with the um, original case from the trial court or the original decision by the trial court. Obviously, then if they reverse it, it goes the other way. They say, you know, the wrong side won. And then if they remand the case, effectively, that's going to be a new trial. So they send it back to the lower court with instructions on what they should have done. So that's what remanding is, sending it back down. All right. And then last. All right. So the U.S. court system. So the, the state court system and the federal court system are pretty similar. So you can see that at the state level, the entry level court is called the trial court. And so those courts decide the facts of the case uh, and they actually try the cases. And then based on what we talked about a second ago on the last slide, if there's an appeal that goes to the state courts of appeal, again, three to five judges most of the time. So it's an odd number. Um, and then they affirm, remand, or reverse the decision. And then if there's an additional appeal, then that can go to the state Supreme Court. So you're three levels up to get to the state Supreme Court. Same concept at the federal level, except that the equivalent of a state trial court is a federal district court. So the names are a little bit different. So you've got 98, as you can see there, federal district courts. Uh, and so these are the, the different circuit courts that you can see there. So there's 13 different courts of appeal. So we are here with um, Chicago or here uh, with Illinois and Indiana. And then where the little star is, that's where the appeals court is. So we're in the seventh uh, circuit. So our closest federal court is in Chicago. And then if your case, and you can see here the little dividing lines. There's the Eastern District of Wisconsin. So actually Whitewater falls under the Eastern, Eastern District of Wisconsin. So if you're fire, filing a federal suit in Wisconsin, uh, based out of Whitewater, um, then the closest federal district court is gonna be in Milwaukee. 
And then if you appeal it, it goes from Milwaukee to Chicago. And then if you appeal it up from there, then it goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court, as you're probably aware, has nine justices rather than three or five, still majority rules. And then the current chief justice is John Roberts. So as far as legal resources go, um, we're not going to get into a whole lot of specifics on this. So these are, um, you can see the federal supplement there. These are, these are referred to oftentimes as reporters. And basically what all of these books are, are the decisions made by judges. So it is where they write down their verdict. They include relevant case law. Here's what I decided. Here are the, here are the relevant precedents. Uh, and so here's why I decided that. So all of those writings are in these types of books or in these reporters. Um, other, so that's your case law. Other sources, obviously, are the U.S. and state constitutions, and then the other sources of law that we talked about. And then secondary sources, so there are uh, law journals that oftentimes, basically, what law journals do is they kind of talk about hypotheticals. Here, here's what would happen if, um, and then they argue for one side or the other. So, for example, one of the ones that we, I think, we'll have time to get to toward the end of the class is related to um, if a wrestler, like a professional WWE kind of a wrestler takes his character with him from one wrestling company to another. He allowed to take his character with him. Um, and so, for example, the Marquette Sport Law Review, I think it's where I got that particular case from, um, talks about the relevant precedents and how they think such a case would be decided. So, um, you know, if you got time for some light reading, the Marquette Sport Law Review is a really great resource and it's available through our library. Um, but there are a number of others. Each, uh, oftentimes law schools will have their own. So the University of Texas is like Texas Law and Entertainment Review or something like that. Miami has a really good one. Um, but Marquette's is, is certainly one of the best. So those are some legal resources available to you. And obviously you're probably going to use Google Scholar a lot, as you will for this week's discussion board. So make sure you do the two discussion boards for this first module. So make sure you do the one on drug testing for high school athletes and also do the one on finding a sport and recreation law case. And then we'll start tort law tomorrow.